Let's have a show of hands of everyone here who was baptized as an infant. Look around. See, got a lot of, a lot of people that were baptized as babies. Well, you probably don't remember it, though, do you? Well, lucky for you, I'm going to instruct you in what happened during that day, because I'm going to read to you what is said to the parents, to your parents, on the day of your baptism. And I'm going to interchange he and she, because I'm politically correct. Okay? <laughs> so, as you all know. Dearly beloved, this child has been reborn in baptism. He is now called the child of God, for so indeed she is. In confirmation, he will receive the fullness of God's spirit. In Holy Communion, she will share the banquet of Christ's sacrifice, calling God her Father in the midst of the church. Well, tomorrow at 4 o'clock in Graham Chapel, and then again at 10.30 in this chapel, we will celebrate the birth of the Son of God. And specifically, we will celebrate the birth of a particular Jew who was born approximately 2,000 years ago in what is now the modern state of Israel. And his name was Jesus of Nazareth, also known as the Son of Man, the Son of David, the Messiah, and a host of other names given to him over time. King of Kings, Lord of Lords, and most notably, Son of God. His birthday came to be known as Christmas, or the Feast of the Nativity, or simply the Incarnation. And Christians for centuries have understood the Incarnation as the moment in time when God became man. This is a complicated and complex phenomena that has produced scholarly and philosophical debate from that time into our day. Now what is accepted by most of us if not all, is that there was a man named Jesus who was born, who lived into his 30s, and who was executed by the occupying Roman government. And what is accepted as fact by Christians is that, that this Jesus was raised from the dead three days after his execution. Now these are things that we all know. And those of us who call Jesus the Son of God believe that the eternal, invisible, and transcendent God became visible in the person of this Jesus of Nazareth, hence the title Son of God. So if Jesus is the Son of God, why does the church refer to all who have been baptized as a child of God, a son of God, a daughter of God? Well, the church does so because that's exactly what you are. Each of you, like Jesus, is a son or daughter of God. What is it that you share with Jesus in this regard? One might arguably say that you share in his incarnation. In a very real sense, the incarnation was something that did not first occur 2,000 years ago. It actually occurred around 14 billion years ago. This is how Franciscan priest and biblical scholar Richard Rohr puts it. The first incarnation happened at the Big Bang, 13.8 billion years ago. Every created thing is the self-emptying of God into multitudinous physical and visible forms. 2,000 years ago, God revealed the human face of love through the incarnation of Jesus. Jesus taught us how to follow him down the path of humility, servanthood, surrender, love and forgiveness. As St. Paul puts it, his state was divine, yet he did not cling to equality with God, but emptied himself, being born in human likeness. So God, as source of all that is, creatively caused all matter to come into being in that explosion of divine energy known as the Big Bang. Invisible spirit became matter, and God's divinity pervades all of creation. As Rohr puts it, the Big Bang is now our scientific name for that pouring out of divine, infinite love into finite, visible form. 
and our theological name for that is simply Christ. So the gospel question for today is, why do people want to become parents? In light of tomorrow's celebration of the Incarnation, we might ask, why does God want to be a parent? Father and mother to Jesus, father and mother to each of us. Let me suggest some answers to those questions at multiple levels of meaning. At a very basic level, God instilled in us a desire to procreate, which I take to mean we partner with God in the continuation of our species. God instilled in us a sexual desire that is so basic and so foundational to continuation of life that we find it present throughout our evolutionary history. Our prehistoric ancestors reproduce themselves in the same way as do we modern homo sapiens. It's a very strong drive. But there's something above and beyond the sexual drive and the resultant continuation of the species. There's something in us who are parents and grandparents that's stronger than our instinctual needs. Think about it. Why would any woman in her right mind submit to the rigors and trials of pregnancy? Who would want to gain 40 pounds in the space of nine months, not be able to wear any of her stylish clothes, have morning sickness, back aches, and all the rest, not to mention the whole giving birth experience that really doesn't look like much fun? Okay. Is that true for those of you who've done that? Not much fun? Lots of, lots of head nodding there. Okay. And if you think a couple who adopts a child has it easy, you'd be mistaken. And while they don't have any of the physical stuff, the psychological factors can be immense. The expense, the extended waiting period, measured more in years than in months, the anxiety of the unknown, the disappointments of failed attempts, and the fear that this baby that you prayed for might be prevented from becoming yours at the 11th hour. For adoptive parents, there are a whole lot more people in the decision-making matrix who can potentially squelch the whole process as compared to those who conceive and give birth themselves. And as the grandfather of both a biological and an adopted grandchild, I can assure you that each method of delivery has its own set of concerns. So why do we do it? We do it because we want to love. We married that man or that woman who became our husband or wife because we wanted to experience love. We decided as a couple to get pregnant or to adopt because we wanted to love more. We as a couple wanted somebody to love. We who are parents know that the love we have for our children is qualitatively different than the love we have for each other as husband or wife. Our love for our children doesn't diminish or detract from the love we have for one another. It actually magnifies it. I can't explain how or why. I just know that it does. And then when we become grandparents, the love we experience for our grandchildren just exponentially explodes. We grandparents can't adequately explain it, but we know that this is something different. It's a love that can't be adequately expressed in mere words. You who are grandparents know this to be true, right? No. Why do you think we grandparents believe the sun rises and sets on our grandchildren and that we just know that this grandson or granddaughter of ours could do no wrong? Where does this ability to love come from? I think most of us intuitively know that it's foundational to our being and hardwired in our species. And most of us rightly attribute this to God and believe that God created us as beings who could love and could love their creator. That God made us to love God might wrongly suggest to some that God somehow was incomplete and needed to feel better about himself by creating a bunch of adoring fans. The reality is that God made us because God, first and foremost, loves us. God makes the first move. You can look up in 1 John 4.10, quote, Love consists of this, not that we have loved God, 
but that God has loved us. Now, we, of course, respond to the love of God by loving back, and that's just how love works. So in a sense, God, who is love itself, cannot not love. Love is God's nature. can't be not who God is. God's love always and everywhere expands and explodes into all that emanates from God. That's the Big Bang. That's the Incarnation. That's where we get the desire and inclination to have children. We need to love, and that need is made manifest in the children that we bring into this world, in partnership, of course, with God. And God's love is perfectly manifest in the person of Jesus of Nazareth, whose birth we celebrate tomorrow night. God's nature is manifest in all that God created, beautifully, particularly, and fully in the person of Jesus. Now, we who are parents see our own selves manifest in the form of the children born to us. It's also true that we see something of ourselves in the children we adopt and raise. I can see my daughter Bridget in my grandson, Marty McDougall. I can see my daughter Amy in my granddaughter Rose, even though she, having been born in China, looks Asian, and Amy, born to Mary and me, who are of Irish and German ancestry, looks more of European descent. Yet Rose is in many ways the spitting image of her adoptive mom. Part of us becomes part of them. Now, in like manner, part of God becomes part of each of us. So far, those expectant mothers whom we will bless at this Mass That includes those who are about to deliver a baby and those who are about to receive an adopted child. They and their husbands will see something of themselves in their children. And God will see something of God's self in these children. So please remember that when you look into their faces for the first time. And keep remembering it as you watch them grow to hopefully become parents and grandparents themselves. So tomorrow we celebrate Jesus as the beloved Son of God. Let us also celebrate our children and our grandchildren as beloved sons and daughters of God. And let us celebrate ourselves as beloved sons and daughters of God. Let us celebrate with joyful thanksgiving the God who loves us so much that he loved us into existence, nurtures and parents us along the way, until we, each of us in our own fullness of time, return to the source and summit of our being.